Greetings, greenhouse people, and welcome to another episode of Tech On Demand, brought to you by Grower Talks. I'm your host, Bill Calkins, and our goal here is to help you grow your best crop ever by sharing cultural and technical information based on discussions with experts around the globe. Although sometimes we will cover other topics in the horticulture realm like nursery and retail. This time, we're joined by Aaron Palmentier, Senior Technical Service Representative with Bayer Ornamentals to talk about preventing and managing disease on poinsettias. Aaron brings extensive experience solving problems and providing pest and disease management recommendations for ornamental producers and landscape professionals. Aaron's a former ornamental specialist at the University of Florida and received his doctorate in plant pathology from Auburn University and his master's and bachelor's degrees in plant and soil science from Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. You'll want to stick around to the end of this podcast to learn about a new resource from Bayer, a Spanish-language pest ID guide that promises to be a must-have at all greenhouses. Disease prevention and control is right in Aaron's wheelhouse, so prepare to get educated. Welcome, I'm Bill Calkins, Senior Editor for Grower Talks and Green Profit, and I'm excited to be joined once again by Aaron Palmatier with Bayer, who's our guest for a series of podcasts covering a range of topics related to pest and disease control on greenhouse and ornamental crops. This episode will focus on disease and poinsettias. And be sure to check out our previous episode on insects and poinsettias, which covered quite a bit and actually touched on overall poinsettia challenges. It actually might be a good idea to jump back and listen to that one, maybe before you listen to this one and kind of use them uh, in tandem. But uh, this uh, episode is going to be focused on poinsettia diseases. And Aaron, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bill. Thanks. Great to be here. So can you remind the listeners about some of the best ways to reach out to you and your team about diagnosing problems? As we mentioned last time, there's a a whole uh, group of experts at Bayer who've been testing out some new ways to connect, as well as some of the more traditional ways. And maybe also reiterate the importance of diagnostics that you mentioned in the previous podcast, because this is something that definitely cannot be overstated. Yeah, ha- happy to do so, Bill. You know, yeah. So the, you know, we have a an ornamental uh, team uh, at Bear that first off, I mentioned you can you can find contact information for myself and everyone on that team by going to just es dot bear b a y e r dot u s, and then you can you can follow the the links to to ornamentals um, from there, but. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, in today's day and age, uh, you know, of course, you've got the, the cell phone uh, and the thing is a lot of these cell phones are equipped with uh, use for not only taking pictures. But so, so, you know, we, we find that, you know, FaceTime for those iPhone users works really well. Uh, but then if you, you, you're, you don't have an iPhone, you're using Android, um, you know, the, the uh, Microsoft Teams has been a great platform that, <clears throat> that we use uh, quite a bit at Bear. And, you know, you don't have to, you, know, you can access that through, through uh, just having that, that data or internet connection on your device. You don't need to have to have any special software. And the same, the same for Zoom uh, is another one that like uh, that you can use. Um, and so, so, you know, I encourage uh, growers to, to use these resources to, to contact, uh, um, you, know, res- uh, you know, the folks at Bear and, and, and any, anyone else that's going to be a, um, you know, an asset uh, to your operation. And, and, you know, so the remote, or distance uh, outreach has been, you know, I guess widely in, embraced, and it's been a great tool. Um, and then the other thing uh, you mentioned, you know, diagnosis, and so, so you know, it's not often, or I should say, it, it, it is often <laughs> that that um, I receive a lot of, you know, a lot of emails uh, and also texts uh, with photos and questions about uh, diseases or disorders. Um, and so that's a really nice way to, to be able to get a, a, a you know, a quick, um, uh, 
you know, answer or in some cases an opinion, because sometimes it could be speculation. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I mentioned in the, in the previous uh, podcast about, you know, the fact that you can talk to plants and they don't talk back. And, and so that's kind of my, my slogan for behind uh, uh, the importance for diagnostics. You know, you're dealing with a, with a silent uh, partner, but, but by all means, uh, it's good to start out and, and contact, you know, some of the, the resources that are available um, and to, to, you know, to dial in, uh, you ask two or three experts, you're likely to get a, a pretty good handle on, on what the problem is. But then with, with disease, you know, it's really important to, to use the diagnostic resources that are out there. So there's, you know, most, I think in, in just about every state, you know, land grant universities have uh, diagnostic clinics. And then, you know, there's also, there's also private diagnostic clinics that you can use to, to send plant uh, disease uh, samples uh, to be able to get a, a diagnosis. Um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, those, the, the lab-based diagnostics is not going to be as quick as, as getting a diagnosis by sending an image, you know, and, and to, to somebody and just, you know, get, getting a pretty quick response. But in the lab, there's a lot more involved, um, especially with, when it comes to, to isolating pathogens and con confirming disease issues. But, but the good thing is, you get that information and then that allows you to, you know, to record when, where that happened. And, and that gives you the more ability to make informed decisions in the future. So, um, you know, that's, it's really important to, to start with a, with a diagnosis of the problem. Yep. So use your diagno diagnostic resources so that you can identify that problem start strong, understand what you're dealing with. Um, sometimes I know that it's, it's nice to get a, a quick answer by sending a photo or shooting someone a text, but then sometimes uh, you really need to, to dig deep, especially on diseases. And, and in that case, uh, some of these diagnostic clinics can certainly uh, be super, super helpful. You can never have too many resources. So let's go ahead and jump into poinsettia diseases because I know you love this topic. I know your background in pathology makes you uh, uh, the perfect expert to talk about uh, diagnosing and treating diseases on poinsettias. And I know that, that like we talked about with insects, diseases and disease pressures are not always the same every year due to all sorts of factors, whether that's environmental or coming from the plants, um, all sorts of uh, different factors. So why don't you talk about some of the most common uh, diseases that you, that you see on, on poinsettias, some of the things that you've seen in recent years, um, and then if you, can, uh, if you can use that information to sort of predict um, what growers might be facing uh, this year and, and in the near future, um, I think that, that that would be a, a great way to start. I'm going to leave this pretty broad and let you take it away because I know that uh, your background is, is going to make this a really a, a good, fun discussion. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to do it. So, you know, yeah, with in, in, in poinsettia production, I mean, I think that uh, when it comes to disease, the big things, you know, out of the chute, you know, propagation, you're dealing with, with pythium, you've also have uh, botrytis in the mix, which can be a problem. Um, in, in certain cases, uh, we see rhizoctonia as well. Uh, that, that can hone in early on on uh, on plants in, in, in propagation. And then you know, and then of course uh, the, these pathogens, botrytis, rhizoc, pythium, as well, can can actually haunt the crop uh, throughout production. Uh, depending, you know, and that, and that depends on on, on where where you're 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 growing uh, poinsettias and and like like Bill mentioned, the environmental conditions. Um, the one thing, um, you know, I, I, I did talk about some regional differences um, with, when we were talking about insects and mentioned like South Florida or Florida being a mecca for mealybugs and you may not see mealybugs on poinsettias in other locations. And, you know, the same can be said uh, for, for disease issues. Um, 
One, one disease that, that I see quite frequently, uh, we had quite a fair amount of it last year on poinsettia, is actually xanthomonas, uh, a leaf spot. And, and that's just one that uh, I see it in, in, uh, in Florida production, um, especially in South Florida. And then you just, you don't see much of it you know, any, anywhere else, uh, or it's, it's, it's pretty infrequent. Um, but it can be a really uh, nasty uh, disease, uh, you know, causing like water soaked uh, lesions on the leaves. And then you, you, you sometimes get these like raised, like areas that appear on the upper leaf surface. Um, and it can actually appear, they kind of turn brown, uh, look like brown colored spots on the leaves. And, and, and that can be, a, that can be a big issue. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to bacteria, uh, and controlling bacteria, you're, you're, you're much more limited than, than what, what you have with, um, with some of the, the other, the other pathogens. And so, so that's, that's one, um, right out of the, the shoot that's, that's like, it's kind of a, I think more of a regional, um, a problem, but the, you know, one of the other things again, in, uh, starting with propagation, uh, and the potential for stress I mentioned in, in the, the previous, uh, podcast about the shipping stress. And so, man, when you've got, when, when, when you've got either plugs or, or liners, um, that, that are being held and they could be being held in, 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 um, uh, heat, heat stress type conditions, um, you know, pathogens love that stuff. And, and so they're definitely, you're going to have a challenge, you know, trying to, to rehydrate or, or you know, uh, to get those, get those, uh, those uh, cuttings going um, and then have a disease problem on top of it, out of the chute, that can be a, can be a real challenge. And, you know, botrytis is one that would, would definitely, um, be a candidate uh, on on stressed uh, tissue, and so um, that you know that's kind of the the big ones um, early on in the crop. You've got your your botrytis, your pythium, the potential for rhizoctonia. Um, all of them can 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 definitely you know they can they can kill young um, young transplants. Um, I mean, so this is nothing. Nothing to overlook. That that's for sure. And of course, if you've got really wet conditions and you've got uh, you know larvae from from fungus gnats in the mix, um, that can just complicate matters um, even more. So so definitely take preventative action when it comes for you know for these these pathogens um, in in propagation. And then the other thing I will mention. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's, I guess, lesser known type uh, of, of pathogens, leaf spot pathogens, such as altenaria um, and, and anthracnose uh, that can move in. Um, in some areas, uh, uh, we've seen, I've definitely seen this um, um, on the East Coast uh, with poinsettias, is, is, is a, there's a pathogen, a fungal pathogen called myrothesium uh, that's it, also a, a leaf spot can actually cause a, a leaf rot um, where, where you get like, like it, it'll, it'll rot parts of the leaves and they kind of fall out. Some, sometimes it'll even leave like a, a shot hole type effect, but, but those are not, um, you know, always, uh, you know, that common, like something like botrytis, but, but definitely uh, you need to be on the on on the lookout for some of these leaf spot pathogens that can that can pop up and 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 I guess uh, I'll put emphasis on if you've got stress plants uh, that's where you're you're really likely to see things like this jump on those 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 uh, compromised plants and then you know the other one that's that's not that common on poinsettia but but it, it has popped up from from time to time and that's actually powdery mildew. Uh, I don't think people think about powdery mildew when they think about poinsettias, but but I have seen it in um, in greenhouses. I've, I've seen it. It's actually been more prevalent um, out west. Uh, powdery mildew um, doesn't, you know, unlike some of the other pathogens, it's it's doesn't need uh, free standing. It doesn't need free moisture. It doesn't need that the leaf wetness. Uh, to to infect plants it, it actually doesn't believe it or not the spores of powdery mildew don't even don't really like water so you just got to have the right humidity 
um, and and you know the, the temperature range, which which typically falls more in line with with the fall part of of, of poinsettia production, those fall months, uh, where where you you might see um, some powdery mildew. And then the other one, you know, the the uh, Phytophthora uh, can also be a problem in poinsettia production. You know, you've got Pythium uh, Phytophthora is very closely related to pythium. It can cause a root, root rot like pythium, but it actually can also move up into the canopy and even cause an aerial blight. Um, so that, that can be uh, pretty, definitely a challenge um, if, if, if it occurs. Um, and so another one uh, to, to look out for. And then I think the, the other one that, that uh, is like powdery mildew is that we don't see it each and every year, um, but, it, but it has shown up is, is the infamous scab. And that, that's the, the fungus name is Spacoloma. And it's actually, there's a species named after poinsettia. So Spacoloma poinsettia. Yeah, and, and scab is one, uh, I have I have seen it, um, it, but but it's not it's not each and every year, and and I think a lot of it is uh, has to do with uh, with resistance and also just just cleaning things up at the source, and and so, uh, but it, you know the good thing about scab is it's a fungal disease that there there are some some really good uh, solutions out there um, to to con control scab. So if it does pop up. Um, it's, it's not one that's, uh, it, that's, uh, that we don't have, uh, tools to control it. Wow. You literally just gave us a laundry list of diseases, <laughs> pythium, botrytis, rhizoctonia, <laughs> anthracnose, scab, powdery mildew, uh, xanthomonas. I mean, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's amazing that a, that a single crop, um, can be impacted by all these different diseases. So I guess my, my follow-up question to that is maybe sort of a back to basics, but can you just give a couple recommend, I mean, all these problems must crop up because of, you know, environmental issues, or at least most of them. Is there, I mean, are there any just sort of general grower guidelines that you would share? We're going to talk about some of the, the chemical solutions um, that are available, but are there any just sort of general grower guidelines that you can offer to help growers um i guess avoid some of the, some of these this multitude of problems while they're you know whether it's propagation but also in in general uh finished plant production uh, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah you know so you know the the challenge in propagation of course is is uh is you know, you know especially if you're trying to to, to root <laughs> you're trying to root cuttings it, you, there's going to be a lot of moisture and of course most of these these root rot stem rot, rot pathogens they they like that wetness but, but you know if you've got rooted rooted liners um coming in uh the key you know the key is 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 not you know not to let uh the crop uh be too wet uh, you know it, it's you don't want to stress them and, and dry them out but you really have to keep them uh allow them to dry out uh and you minimize moisture um it's going to help with a lot of these uh pathogens um you know the 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 root rot pathogens that that are colonizing your roots that are in your bedding mix um, you know, they, they, they need uh, that moisture. And in some cases, they're even, the spores are even moving in, in the irrigation water. Uh, but they, they need that moisture for, for, the, for the infection process where they can cause root rots and stem rots. And then the same, the same for the foliar pathogens. So the leaf wetness duration is, is really important. Um, you know, if you, you allow things to dry out, the longer that foliage is dried out, uh, the better. I mean, if you can use uh, a drip irrigation system and not use overhead, uh, you're going to have a lot less leaf spot disease problems. But in many cases, that's either not economically feasible. And so, you know, you just want to time your, your irrigation practices to allow for, for that canopy to dry out. You know, spacing the plants appropriately to allow for good air movements, another thing that can, can really help. Um, and so, you know, those, those are some of the, 
you know, key cultural things that you can do. And of course, you know, sanitation, 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 <laughs> you know, that's, that's just super important. Um, you know, you want to, you want to use clean, everything's got to be clean. You know, the cleaner your operation, the, the, the less problems you're going to have from a, from a disease standpoint, for sure. Those are good. And those are good general grower guidelines for moisture management, for the spacing to allow for the air movement, sanitation. I'm sure we could spend hours talking about sanitation. Um, but no, I, I appreciate that. And I think that it's just a good, good reminder for, you know, if you've been growing for 30 years or if this is your first year, I think they, these are all excellent reminders. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the specific solutions from Bayer. What do you, what do you guys have in your vast toolbox for poinsettia diseases? Yeah, so I'm, I'm really excited to talk about uh, our, newest, our newest fungicide, uh, which is broad form. And, and broad form, one of the, <laughs> the nice things, well, first of all, broad form is, is the name kind of implies it is broad spectrum. And so uh, having said that, you know, it's, it's, it's labeled um, for control of you know, over 50 different um, uh, diseases. And so um, just about everything I talked about today, the altenaria, the anthracnose, the botrytis, the, the pythium, the phytophthora, the rhizoctonia, um, you know, that broad form is, is, is effective on all those different diseases, the scab as well. Um, so, so that's, I mean, that's one of the things that's definitely going to be a great fit for, for poinsettia production. Um, you know, when it comes to, uh, botrytis especially, which can be, which can be a big problem in, 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 uh, from, from propagation throughout the crop, uh, you know, the, uh, the broad form has been just outstanding and Bear has another, uh, product, uh, chip code 26019, uh, flow which is a great rotation partner, uh, you know, cause it's all about minimizing resistance. Uh, so you can rotate the, the 26019 flow with the broad form, uh, for control of your, you know, the, the rise octonia, your, your, um, your vitritis issues. Um, and then, you know, some of the foliar, foliar leaf spot pathogens. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, really, really excited to, to bring in a, a new fungicide that can go into, um, you know, poinsettia production um, and basically cover, you know, the, the spectrum of diseases that, it, that, that are, are pathogens, I should say, that attack poinsettias. That's awesome. And I think that growers will certainly appreciate that considering uh, all the different obstacles that could, uh, come in, in the path of, uh, of producing your best poinsettia crop that you possibly can. So um, broad spectrum is definitely huge. I like uh, that, that you also have that additional uh, chip code product that, that you can use in rotation because like you said, reducing resistance or uh, avoiding resistance is definitely key. So I really appreciate your time again, Aaron. Um, your expertise on pathogens is very evident, and I know that the listeners are going to have a lot of notes to go through, as well as new strategies to put in place after this discussion. Do you have anything to add before we close here today? I, I think I'll just, uh, you know, I'm going to end on focusing, you know, fo fo uh, you know, use the resources that are available um, you know, there's so many, so many solid, you know, resources out there, especially, you know, I, I'll just put a plug in for, for grower talks. I mean, I, I, I see all these different articles from, from month to month that, that are often timely and relevant. Um, but, you know, use, use your resources in today's day and age, it's easy to, to reach out, um, to, and contact people and share information. And I, I think that's, um, really important. Um, Again, you know, it's it's all about making informed decisions and and being able to to control problems or fix you know fix find solutions fix issues uh, as quickly as possible. I think Excellent. that's kind of my my take home. <laughs> I love it, and I appreciate the uh, Grower Talks plug. I'll send one back your way. That uh, if you if you have questions for for Aaron and the Bayer team, there's all sorts of different ways to reach out. Um, go to their website. 
Uh, he gave you the, uh, the web address. We'll also put it in the show notes for anybody uh, who wants to, to, to check out the, the Bayer Ornamentals team and uh, see, see what, what uh, opportunities they have to utilize those resources. So until next time, I'm Bill Calkins with Grower Talks and Green Profit. And, and on behalf of Aaron Palmatier at Bayer, we, we want to wish you a fantastic season as you produce this key holiday crop and hopefully uh, produce it uh, disease-free. Thank you, Bill. Bayer Ornamentals recently released an excellent tool that'll no doubt be quite useful in your greenhouse. It's a user-friendly Spanish language pest ID guide. And I wanted to take a few minutes to talk to Bayer's senior technical service representative, Aaron Palmatier, about what's covered in the guide and how he sees it being used by greenhouse professionals across the United States. So Aaron, why don't we start with a quick overview of the Spanish Pest ID Guide and what growers can expect to find between the covers. All right, Bill. Um, yeah, first of all, the, the new Spanish Pest ID Guide from Bear can help cultivate stronger communication in greenhouse and, and nursery operations. Uh, the, the whole idea is for a user-friendly guide. It's easy to follow includes numerous pictures uh, to help Spanish speakers identify pests. Um, and the other thing is we've incorporated, you know, it, it, uh, some information on how to, to best use solutions from Bear. So we have some of our fungicide solutions, insecticide solutions, and, and herbicide solutions built into the guide. But it also includes information on what types of personal protection equipment should be worn when making these applications. Um, and one thing I will note also, uh, you mentioned in between the pages, but the guide is actually produced on a, on a really uh, high quality coated paper so that it's, it's gonna be nice for, you know, for having outside in the elements. Uh, and it's you know, bound together uh, to survive you know, wear and tear. Excellent. I, that's definitely always an issue uh, when you're working uh, in a greenhouse environment. And that's really cool that it includes all the photos um, that folks are going to need to ID these pests. So I think that that gives the listeners a pretty good overview. So one of my questions is, why did Bayer decide to develop a Spanish language pest ID guide? Um, because you guys are known for all of your resources. So why, you know, wh why did you guys decide to uh, launch this uh, Spanish uh, language guide to supplement all these resources. Sure, sure. You know, so one, you know, the ability to quickly identify and treat pests is an important part of, you know, of what we do in ornamentals for, for healthy plants. And so it's even easier if you have a guide that speaks the language of, of some of, of, you know, some of the, the workers that are in your facility. And so, you know, that's why Bear developed a new ID guide specifically for Spanish speaking growers and, and laborers. And again, this, this guide is, is not like real advanced. This is, this is very, you know, uh, I, I like to say fundamental, uh, but the, the, the key is you know, easy to use. The guide helps bridge communication gaps to ensure everyone knows how to properly identify pests. And then, and then of course, use our products properly and, and, and safely. Um, you know, we want to, at Bear, we want to continue expanding diversity and inclusion and bringing people together. So I think the, the new Spanish guy does that. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, it is really, uh, like you said, all about communication and bridging those communication gaps. So I think that, uh, that that's a really important point. Um, and the fact that uh, it talks about helping quickly identify, and I know that's one of uh, one of the things you always mention is that that diagnosis and how critical that is. So uh, that that's great, and this is going to be a really useful resource. Um, if listeners want to order a copy or multiple copies, how how are they going to access this guide? Sure. So it's actually it's going to be available, and it's starting. At, it's going to be sometime in you know the beginning of July. And they'll be able to go on to the, the Bear website, and it's really simple. It's just es.bear, B-A-Y-E-R, dot U-S. And then if you do forward slash Spanish dash test dash identification dash guide, that, that's a link that will uh, bring you right to a web page uh, to, to access, uh, to order the guides. 
And, you know, go, go ahead. I was going to say that's great. And we will actually put a link to that in the show notes so that folks can uh, quickly click on that link. Um, so that would be July 2020 availability. Um, and yeah, so all you need to do is look in the show notes uh, of this podcast and you'll see a, a quick link uh, to access this guide. So I, I appreciate that, Aaron. I, I definitely think growers are going to appreciate uh, the effort that Bayer put into this, and it's going to be a useful resource really for, for greenhouses of any uh, shape and size um, that has a, a Spanish-speaking workforce. This is going to be a, a great tool to have in the toolbox. So I appreciate uh, you letting us all know about that. Thank you.